Welcome to this introductory video on improvement measurement basics. My name is Dr. Susie Miltner, and I am a faculty member at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing and a member of the VAX National Faculty. Warning, what you are about to see will appear very basic, simple, and easy. Unfortunately, it is not easy in real life. Do not underestimate the importance of getting the fundamentals right including measurement basics. Please take the time and put in the effort to do this right. You will be glad that you did. We measure to understand what is occurring, to determine if it is due to chance or assignable causes, to determine if improvement or implementation interventions are working, and to assess sustainability, reliability, and accountability. The objectives for this module are to learn how to identify appropriate measures for your improvement work and differentiate conceptual and operational definitions. The improvement process starts with identifying a problem and understanding what the current process is. Don't shortchange this part of the process. Inevitably, learning the baseline process will make you aware of improvement opportunities. Once you have identified the opportunities for your improvement, you need to set your aims for the work. The crucial message from this graphic is that your measures and measurement plan must be driven by your global aim, which is usually an organizational imperative, and your specific aim, which is what you are specifically striving for in your improvement work. From those aims, you and your team will make decisions about what change ideas you will test. Once you understand the baseline process, write your aims and decide what your first tests of change are. You determine what measures you need to see if your change ideas really make an improvement. Each of your measures needs a conceptual definition and an operational definition. Most improvers struggle about the differences and details between conceptual and operational definitions, which we will talk about shortly. Finally, each measure needs a plan to collect and analyze the data when it's obtained. I have visualized the inverted pyramid in a stepwise fashion. The first four steps in this visual are the actual improvement work you are doing. The last two are not your actual improvement work. The measures are your dashboard for how your project is going. Again, people frequently confuse the measures for the improvement project. Let's use an example for something you probably do daily. You probably drive to work. Your dashboard provides a lot of data to tell you how your car is doing while you drive to work. You could drive to work without a dashboard, theoretically. You might get a ticket for inadvertently speeding, or you might run out of gas unexpectedly, but you could still drive. The same thing happens with clinical improvement work. You can do this operational work without collecting data, but you won't really know if your changes are improvement without the data or the measures. So first, a little theory. Measurement, simply, is the process of assigning numbers to some characteristic or variable of interest. Now, truth be told, there are people who devote their lives' work to measurement, including testing new measures. But for most of us as clinical improvers, it is best to try to identify measures that are already well-defined and recognized as valid and reliable, as well as being feasible both to collect and to use. Measurement is a complex field of study, so figuring out your measures is one part, hard part of improvement work. You have heard the terms metrics, measures, and indicators in your work. What are they and what's the difference between them? Metric is a system or standard of measurement. It generally refers to all the ways we measure a dimension or criteria of a construct and or how we measure something over time. A measure is a number that reflects an observable value and consists of a number and a unit of a measure. And so for example, 4,000 people swabbed for COVID-19 in a, some period of time. And finally, there's indicator. And an indicator is a variable that gives a means to express results and may aggregate or combine measures. Let me use an example. If you fill up your gas tank, what the gas pump says is a measure because there are regulations and licensing around accurate pump measures so you don't get cheated. But when I drive my car and look at the gas gauge, what I see is an indicator. That electronic gauge can only give me an indication of how much gas is left in my tank. So it's not a true measure that's accurately telling me exactly how many gallons are left in the tank. 
we frequently use these terms interchangeably, and most of the time that is probably okay. There are literally thousands of metrics monitored nationally, locally, and within microsystems. Ideally, you choose metrics, especially outcome measures, that are well-defined across systems. Here are some examples of typical outcome measures, including patient experience, length of stay, readmission rates, mortality, patient harm events, and cost per discharge. Process measures are also important. While there are national process measures like smoking cessation education, many are locally developed based on local needs. A good measure is standardized, actionable, can be attained in a timely manner, is stable and capable of being looked at over time, and it's affordable and relevant to the project at hand. Try to pick measures that are already available or have good operational definitions from other reliable sources or experts. Some examples of where to find these measures include the CMS Measures Inventory, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the National Quality Forum. Your organization may have specific measures developed locally. It is most important to have the measures that are most directly relevant and actionable for your project. Sometimes improvers really get hung up on their measures data above any other part of the improvement process. Healthcare measures reflect what is happening within the system. They aren't the actual work of the system, and they are not your actual improvement work in the system. It is important to remember that measurement is necessary for change, but it is insufficient to produce change. There are many challenges when you select your project measures, including that there are no perfect measures for any project. Every measure has problems, including measurement error, timeliness, cost, and standardization. Also, there are multiple ways to operationalize any conceptualized measure. So hand washing is one classic healthcare example. You could measure hand washing by direct observations through patient surveys or by uh, the cost and volume of hand sanitizer in the whole facility. The third thing is that the best may measure may not be feasible for your use. You may not be allowed to obtain the data for some kind of organizational reasons. Maybe they think it's too confidential. Or the measure may require a usage feed from the developer. It's okay to choose the next best measure. You do the best that you can. Another challenge is that despite the ubiquitous nature of electronic health records, you may not be able to easily pull from the EHR. So you may have to resort to manual data collection like chart audits to get clinical data. Finally, many people overcomplicate their measures. You need to identify the minimum number of measures that will allow you to make good decisions about your improvement work and no more. On a project working on pressure ulcer prevention at the Birmingham VA, we developed a two-page audit tool to do a deep dive into the pressure ulcer prevention process at the facility so we could assess baseline performance. We did 50 random chart audits, and each audit took us 30 minutes to complete. During that project, it turned out that the only data we really used was the Braden score, which is a risk assessment for pressure ulcers. So what's the lesson learned? Don't collect data you're not going to use, and pilot your measures and data collection plan before you go full steam ahead on your project. New improvers often have difficulty picking measures. You will almost always have a measure that reflects your specific aim or outcome measure, and you almost always need other measures as well. It is often useful to think of having a measurement framework as a structure for your measurement plan. Measures at the regional and national level for healthcare organization is usually either the Donabedian structure process outcome model or the quality aims steep model. And STEEP stands for safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. For most local QI projects, the use of outcome measures, process measures, and balancing measures is a good structure, as is the clinical value compass. The clinical value compass was developed in the early 1990s when two physicians and their team identified the outcomes that would make them the best unit. This framework balances the quality and cost of care in order to provide high value healthcare. In this framework, improvers would consider clinical measures, functional status measures, experience measures, and the costs of care. I would highly encourage you to consider measuring costs in your improvement work.
A useful place to start for new improvers is the IHI framework for outcome process and balancing measures. Outcome measures reflect the impact of your work and they should almost always come directly from your aim statement. Process measures reflect the steps of the workflow. Theoretically, you could choose any or all of the steps, but it's probably best to identify key steps in the current process that will be most impacted by your change ideas. And finally, balancing measures reflect the unintended consequences of your improvement work. You ask yourself, what could go wrong if you make changes? You may wonder about structural measures. Structural measures give people a sense of the healthcare system's capacity and processes. They include things like whether or not a system uses electronic health records, uh, what kind of technology is available, the number or proportion of board certified physicians, et cetera. From my experience, it is rare to use structural measures in a microsystem level improvement project, but it may be necessary if there is variation that may impact your project. Examples include variable staffing related to different scheduled patient volumes by clinic day, or the number of beds staffed per shift or day. So what's the difference between a conceptual definition and an operational definition? Abstractness versus specificity. So a conceptual definition is the description of what the concept means in relationship to your improvement work or to other constructs. So what is the concept you want to measure? An operational definition specifies in detail how you will measure the concept you identified as important to your work. So an operational definition, again, is specific enough for someone not involved in the project to understand the data and to replicate how you're collecting the data. You have to define the details when you create these operational definitions, and that includes the population you're measuring, the time frame, et cetera. So in this example on this slide, the, con the concept of interest is completed diabetic foot exams in Clinic X. How are we going to measure that? And in this case, the team decided that the operational definition would be by week. They would count the number of completed foot exams for eligible patients by the medical assistant in the clinic each week, and they would put that over the number of diabetic patients who are eligible for foot exams seen in the clinic each week. So you can see the level of detail in that operational definition, and you can see that someone could duplicate that. This measures grid is taken from the VAX QI template using the IHI recommended framework for measures. Note that each measure has a conceptual definition and tells us what we want to measure. There are two examples of operational definitions for each conceptual measure. This shows you have multiple choices of how you can operationalize the measure you identified. You can actually measure the concept of interest in multiple ways if you like, but in unit level improvement work, you'll likely choose only one way. So for example, in this case, falls is conceptually defined as an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or floor or other lower level. And it can be operationally defined as the number of falls for a certain period of time, maybe by day, week, or month. Or it could be the number of falls per thousand patient days, again, by day, week, or month. So you might ask, if I achieve my outcome measure, why would I need a process and balancing measure? Well, outcome measures can be delayed. So for example, if you wanted to collect data on 30-day readmissions, you have to wait at least 30 days or longer to find out that information. Process measures can also help you a lot in your improvement. They help you understand why the outcome is not achieved. Perhaps the process isn't going exactly the way you wanted it to go. It also helps you plan the next PDSA cycle, and it can help you assess the reliability and sustainability of a process. Balancing measures ensure that you aren't causing any unintended consequences from the improvement project. Once you have identified your measures and created operational definitions, you will immediately need to consider your data collection plan. This slide shows the aspects of data collection that must be considered for an effective data plan. We will focus on this in a subsequent video. In summary, measurement should speed up improvement, not slow it down. The goal is improvement, not measurement, but you do need to measure. 
You need just enough information to know that your change is an improvement. And the most important point is that good operational definitions give you, your team, and other stakeholders clarity about what your data represents.